there is a habit in uh, Christianity, as well as in the world, that some of us call it too big to fail. It's this whole concept that once something gets big enough, it needs to perpetuate itself to keep it going because it's doing such a great work and such a marvelous ministry that we don't want it to fail because if it goes down, then what will happen to all the people that depended upon it? And I don't mean just for jobs or for livelihood, but for its impact of all the good that it did. You know, PTL was, PTL Club was one of those types of ministries that everyone said was, oh, it's too big to fail. It's too big to be wrong. It's too much of an impact now on television, on society, on Christianity as a whole, that we have all these speakers that come on, all these people. Never mind the leadership has gotten off on a tangent. It's too big to fail. In our monetary systems we look at now as because they're so enwrapped in each other, they're wrapped up together that some systems and some, and some banks and some investments are too big to fail. They can't be broken up. They can't be separated. They can't be segregated. What if God judges them? What if God decides to reject them? in a ministry? Or what if God decides to bring down a house because of the storms of life come and that too big to fail comes crashing down? There is a pride that is too big to win. It's too big to fail in some ways because the person is too big in their own eyes to admit they're wrong. So you see, Pride can become too big to fail because it will not let you admit you're wrong. Pride can get into your life in such a way that you can admit to yourself that you're too important to do or be something God wants you to be or to do. It may be that pride comes in to such a degree that you're so big but you can't admit you failed God and now you won't do what he wants you to do to repent to ask him for his forgiveness to show his mercy by your failure to live up to what people thought you were as opposed to what you really are sinner I know for myself I make no pretense on this these videos I tell you, give me five minutes alone and man, I'll, I'll dive into sin. <laughs> it's very tempting. And the world out there is a tempting place. And you will fall down. You will make mistakes. You will fail. So anytime you see a minister or ministry out there that acts like it's oh so righteous and kept so pure and doesn't admit its own faults, maybe their pride is too big to fail. I would more rather see a man come to me and tell me he failed and has been forgiven and moves on than for a person to come to me and say no I got so much of the Holy Spirit inside that I don't sin I am filled with love brother I am going on in my righteousness and God has delivered me from the body of sin and Satan can't get a foothold yeah and that's a pride there's no doubt about that because the scripture says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Fallen short of the glory of God. Until you get saved. It says all. So the reality of sin is in the person's life. They wrestle with it. They deal with it. Paul himself said, the good that I would I do not and that which I would not I do. Who can deliver me from this body of sin? And he thanks God for Jesus Christ. Because God gives him not just the ability to do some of the things he wants to do, but also to ask forgiveness for the things he didn't do and mercy for the things he did do that were sinful. Who's too big to fail again? 
Let's look at Paul. Is Paul too prideful to fail? Paul was more than willing to confess his sins, to admit that he needed forgiveness, and it was the grace of mercy which caused him to move and to be. And he knew of his own unrighteousness, for he said he prayed to be counted worthy to be spared of these trials and tribulations that were coming upon the world. He prayed that he would be counted worthy, because he wasn't. He was told what things he must go through in order to suffer. The Spirit of God told the church that they had separated Paul and Barnabas from the church to do those things that the Spirit of God wanted done. And that there was much that they would suffer at the hands of men in order to accomplish the work of God. So who is too big to fail? How much pride do you have that won't let you fail? Can you admit you are a failure? Can you admit that you fail in some things daily? And that even in the reality of what you're walking in with your friends, sometimes you have such pride in what you're doing that you won't admit that you blow it? Do you try to hide that fact from your friends and fellow workers, from your ministry, from your work at work? Have you gone up and admitted in your job that instead of hiding the fact that you blew it, you let someone else take the fall? Then instead of admitting the truth about who was in charge and who did fail, you're going to blame someone else? Do you admit in your own marriage that is a divorce now, that you've been divorced and that you failed? Not the person you blamed in the marriage, your wife or your husband or the children or the economy or, oh, some other thing. But can you admit you failed? Are you too proud to fail? I failed many times in everything. I used to say I failed in every job I tried because I succeeded in every job I tried too, which is kind of interesting way to look at it. What I got hired on, I failed at because I always wound up moving out of it and moving upward. But in a lot of ways, there was a failure too because I wasn't content to stay in the position that I was in or to even stay with where I was and what I was doing. So a lot of things that I did, I looked at and said, oh, failure. And God said, no, now that you've admitted it is failure, I can make you and show you the success that I have done. So you see, there's some things that are failures that God, wanted you to fail in. He hoped you would recognize in your failure his success. Don't get too big. Don't get so prideful. Don't be so wrapped up with yourself that you can't look at your own sinful, disgusting reality of who you are inside, which is total sinner that you are and be disgusted by yourself and then praise God for the reality of his grace and his mercy and his love that has reached out and taken a person like you and me and fashioned and formed it into maybe not a perfect vessel yet that has to be squashed again and then fashioned and formed again until finally he can take as a potter does with the clay and form it perfectly into the image of his son. But his son is perfect. Are you? Are you? What kind of sin are you in? Do you hide your porno time? Do you hide your adultery? Do you hide your finances? Do you hide the fact that you hate someone? Do you hide from God who sees all, knows all, and is aware of all of it? I can't because I know better. I hate the life I live sometimes because I find myself sinning and then thinking and knowing that God was in that sin. I think, oh, God, how can I stop? 
please forgive me, help me, take me to the place of your mercy and grace and let me find forgiveness, for I am in need of your love. Are you too big to fail? Are you too prideful? Have you become so puffed up that you can't admit your sin? Sometimes I wonder. Because if you're anything like me, it only takes one little poke, one little stab, one little innocent remark by someone else, and boom, you explode with all this hot air of yourself that was inside that wasn't the Spirit of God, wasn't the joy of the Lord, wasn't the love of God flowing out of you to all those around you, but was your own hot air that as soon as you were attacked, as soon as you were poked, as soon as you were prodded, as soon as you were antagonized, you showed what you were made out of and vomited on that person everything except the peace, the love, and the joy. Because that pride had puffed you up and made you able to expand outward and become full of your own hot air until you got poked by God with your own sin. What to concentrate on? I came not to send peace, but a sword, Matthew 10, 34. Never be sympathetic with the soul whose case makes you come to the conclusion that God is hard. God is more tender than we can conceive of, and every now and again he gives us a chance of being the rugged one, that he may be the tender one. If a man cannot get through to God, it is because there is a secret thing he does not want to give up and never intended to. I will admit I have done wrong, but I have no more intend to give up that thing than fly. It is impossible to deal sympathetically with a case like that. We have to get right deep down to the root until there is antagonism and resentment against the message. People want the blessing of God, but they will not stand the same thing that goes straight to the quick. They will not stand that which goes to the heart of their own fleshy desires and wants and their own sin inside, that they will antagonize and reach out and speak of and highlight that reality in someone else when the reality is they are the ones that God was speaking to. I have seen in ministry so many times one minister or one person or one spokesperson go out of their way to sign up for a, a program or a ministry or a leadership position and say, we are advocating anti-homosexuality. And they turn out to be men who fall into homosexuality behavior. Or they are people who go, oh, we are into, you got to obey the law. And then they turn around and they contradict the very things that they say. The bottom line is this. Often it is not that which God has done in them, but what God is trying to show them that they need to deal with, that they jump into and try to point out to others. Sadly, they don't get the message, but take it out on others. If God has had his way with you, your message as his servant is merciless insistence on the one line to cut down to the very root, otherwise there will be no healing. You are a sinner, and you are saved by grace. Drive home the message until there is no possible refuge from its application. Begin to get at people where they are until you get them to realize what they lack. And then erect the standard of Jesus Christ for their lives. We can never be like that. Then drive it home. Jesus Christ says you must. But how can we? You cannot unless you have a new spirit. Luke eleven thirteen. There must be a sense of need before your message is of any use. Thousands of people are happy without God in this world.
if I were, was a happy and moral till Jesus came, why did he come? Because of that kind of happiness and peace is on a wrong level. Jesus Christ came to send a sword through every peace that is not based on a personal relationship with him. In other words, you cannot be satisfied with anything less than knowing God more. And if you're satisfied with that, then you'll find that you have not wanted to know God, but you wanted to be forgiven by God to get away with what you want to do. The reality of where we are is always boiled down to, will we come to Jesus as we are and find mercy and grace? Will we come to Jesus and ask for his forgiveness? Will we come to Jesus and ask him to cleanse us from sin? Will we come to Jesus and ask him to take away our pride? Will we literally come to Jesus? Because if you're not willing to come to Jesus and let him show you who you are, you'll always have an excuse for the reason of what you do, where you go, and what you say, and the way you are. God wants you to be like him, not to be in any other way except to be like Jesus today.